Coming up on Locked On Dodgers, Mookie Betts had a big day. So we're going to talk about his MVP case. We're going to talk about maybe moving him in the lineup. We're going to answer a few more of your listener questions about uh, Kevin Pillar and Jake Lamb. Uh, and we're going to revisit the the trade the Dodgers made with the Nationals last year and say, you know what, would we do it again? So let's talk Dodgers. You are locked on Dodgers, your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Dodger fans. This is Locked On Dodgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first lesson every weekday morning. Remember, the show is free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube simply by searching for Locked On Dodgers. Or go ahead and subscribe wherever you're watching or listening right now, and then you will never miss a day because you know we're not going to. If this is your first time watching or listening, my name is Jeff Snyder. That next to me is my co-host, Vince Samperio. Vince and I are both lifelong Dodger fans just like you are, and we both spent time covering the Dodgers in the press box and the locker room. So we're not quite insiders, which is probably a good thing, but we bring you the smart fans perspective on our boys in blue every weekday morning. So again, please subscribe wherever you're watching and listening, and let's talk about the Dodgers. Vince, uh, a day after the Dodgers scored 10 runs with zero homers, they scored nine runs, and eight of them came via the homer, four home runs. Uh, They had a solo shot, two two run homers, and a three run homer. They had a chance to complete the, the home run cycle. They had bases loaded and one out or maybe two outs anyway, had a chance to complete it, but Max Muncy drew a base with a little walk, and then Justin Turner made the third out of the inning, so they didn't quite get that grand slam. But all in all, we'll take a 9-4 to win. Yeah, you'll take nine runs any day of the week, especially with Walker Buehler on the mound. Walker Buehler uh, gave up three in the first, ended up making it through six without giving up any more in the final five frames. So, you know, still maybe not so much quite a Walker Buehler start, but – more of a walkie wheeler started in the vein that he struggles early on and then settles in. So maybe that's a good sign. Uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously the offense is, is the bigger part of the game yesterday. Yeah, the game seemed like it was going to be kind of a slugfest early on. Dodgers scored two in the top of the first, made Josiah Gray throw 40 pitches in the first inning. Uh, the Nats came back and scored three off Bueller in, in the bottom of the first. But then Bueller didn't allow anything else. He went five scoreless innings after that, gave six solid innings. Six innings, three runs, you know, definition of a, of a quality start. So we'll take it. Uh, the, the fastball still isn't there. He didn't get any swings and misses on his fastball. Uh, I felt like it was more effective later in the game, commanded a little bit, bit better. Even though he wasn't getting swings and misses on it, it seemed like it was working a little bit better for him. So he's able to play off the, uh, the off-speed pitches a little bit more. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's – you know, until he finds a fastball, he's not going to be the Walker Buehler, but he was mixing it up early in the count pretty well and you know, was able to get the cutter over for a strike. And I think that's the main part. Uh, if he can get the cutter and, and some of this other off-speed switch over for strikes early in the count, then he can offset the fastball not quite being there yet. Yeah, the big story, though, was Mookie Betts. Two of those four home runs came from him, and uh, it was kind of funny. They went to almost the exact same spot. The second one was about – five feet to the right and maybe I think one row farther back than the first one, but the same fan had a chance to catch both of them. Uh, The first one hit him in the glove and he dropped it. The second one, uh, I think he should have got a glove on it and he didn't. So uh, I don't know that guy. I hope he's not a listener. I'll feel bad if he is a listener and I'm making fun of him, but uh, you know, he, he did everything right. Jerry Harrison was talking about on the post game show, you know, he brought his glove and everything, but you got to make a play. And uh, Allie, I think that was the name of the, the lady who hosts the, the post game show or who was tonight. And she was saying, Oh, the Dodgers should send that guy a ball. And Jerry Harrison was not having, he's like, no, he had a chance at two of them. And, you know, I don't say this very often, but I'm on Jerry's side. <laughs> yeah. I guess it, you know, the, obviously he uh, a little bit older. I remember last or last week, the other day, there was that, that Dodgers fan on Twitter getting blamed Dodgers fan. Cause he wasn't wearing no Dodger gear being blamed for not giving the ball back to a little kid. Um, but the ball was thrown right to you, kid, and you missed it. So, you know, that's, sometimes life works that way. Yeah, if it hits you in the glove. I got made fun of at a Braves game one time. My first game uh, at whatever, Turner Field, their old stadium, or their most recent old stadium, uh, I walked into the stadium and first batting practice ball hit right to me. I didn't have my glove, 
with me and I had my camera bag over my, this was back when people used to carry actual cameras and it was hanging over my shoulder. And as the ball was coming, my camera bag slipped off my shoulder down to my elbow and kind of jerked my arm a little bit. And the ball hit me right in the chest and, and bounced down. And Jack Wilson, a former pirates infielder was the Braves hitting coach at the time. And he heckled me hard from, from the outfield, from the warning track. And you got to make that play. And my chest hurt the rest of the day. That was uh, that was the first time I ever saw Freddie Freeman in person. He had a home run for me. So, uh, you know, ten years ago last week. Um, but let's talk about Mookie Betts, not about my my travels to Atlanta. Uh, a lot of people I saw a lot of talk about Mookie Betts being in the MVP conversation now, and it's kind of funny for as slow as he started. But uh, yeah, I mean, Mookie Betts isn't just having a resurgence. He is now in. He's having really good season territory. Yeah, I mean, through April 20th, Mookie Betts had zero home runs. Uh, Since April 21st, he's now the leader in home runs in the National League with 12. He's hitting the ball all over the place. He leads the league in runs. He has, uh, what, 12 straight games with a run scored. So the name of the game is driving runs in and and scoring runs. Uh, I talked a little bit last week about how scoring runs isn't always necessarily dependent upon you, obviously, uh, but you have to get on base in order to score runs, and knowing who he has behind him, getting on base is the name of the game. Even when he wasn't hitting, he was drawing walks. Now he's continuing to to get on base, but also doing so via hits. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's, you know, Bryce Harper is another name in the National League, uh, but I think a lot of the big names that we've kind of heard about have been American League. You know, Aaron Judge is tearing it up over there in the American League. Uh, but in the National League, you know, Mookie Betts is going to be right in the thick of it, especially for the Dodgers, who, you know, even though it's not a, a an, an award about who's on a better team, uh, MVPs usually come from teams that are in the playoffs. Yeah. Uh, the, the one person, though, who may have a thing to say about it at this point is Manny Machado. Oh, yeah. Machado is currently leading the National League in all three triple count, not all three triple count categories. He's leading the league in batting average, on-base percentage, and slugging percentage. Uh, so obviously also an OPS and OPS plus, uh, and he's got eight home runs, n- nothing to, nothing to sneeze at. He leads the league in war, whether you're looking at uh baseball reference or fan grass, Manny Machado has actually a pretty healthy lead in the national league. Uh, it's kind of interesting on baseball reference, both Tom, Tommy Edmond and Nolan Arenado of the Cardinals are ahead of, of Mookie Betts in the national league, just behind Machado. Uh, whereas on fan graphs, it's just Machado ahead of, of ahead of Mookie in the National League. Arenado and Edmund are both right behind Mookie uh, on fan graphs. Uh, the a lot, all four of those guys have some value coming from their defense. You know, uh, Machado and Arenado are both elite defensive third baseman. Tommy Edmund is a very good defensive player. Obviously, we know Mookie Betts' defense. Uh, and this is all numbers before Wednesday's game or Tuesday's game. So uh, these f- sites don't open. They don't update till overnight, so I don't know where Mookie's war is going to go based on uh, tonight's game, but it'll go up, obviously, and it might it might pass both of those guys on uh, baseball reference, too. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Manny Machado is going to have to slow down for some, uh, you know, or, or the Padres are going to have to slow down. Like you said, that's kind of one of the big things is a lot of the times you get extra credit for your team making the postseason. And uh, last year, I don't know if you heard, the Padres had kind of a big collapse last year. I wasn't aware of that. Uh, speaking of collapses, currently at the recording, the Giants have just given up six runs and they need to the Mets, and now they're losing 10 8. So. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh. And, and uh, are the Padres still losing? When we when we started recording this, the Padres are down 4 to 1 to the Brewers. So uh, Yeah, still down 4 to 1 right now. That's good news. Uh, Dodgers will gain a game on the on the Padres if that can hold out. Uh, anyway, Mookie Betts is, is awesome. And it's like I said, it's not just a hot streak anymore. He is just having. A great season, which is what we expect from Mookie. I'm excited to see if he can keep that up. Yeah, the one other thing with, like, MVP cases, especially, you know, before the Dodgers didn't necessarily have it, they didn't have the big, big names. They were just collectively good. You know, the years of, of Justin Turner and, and you know, Matt, even Max Muncy and guys like that. But this year, they're going to have, you know, Freddie Freeman still up there in terms of number-wise. Trey Turner is going to be up there in terms of numbers at the end of the year, you would imagine, and Mookie Betts as well. So, you know, in theory, they're going to take some votes away from each other. So it's a lot harder, whereas Manny Machado, 
you know, even if Eric Cosmer continues to be good, I think he's already cooled off a little bit, but even if he continues to be decent, you know, nobody's thinking about Eric Cosmer as an MVP candidate. But if Freddie Freeman and Trey Turner keep up what they're doing, you know, they're considered at least low tier MVP candidates along with Mookie Betts. So, you know, Machado doing it all with, with, you know, with the narrative, the narratives get built too, you know, without Tatis in the lineup for most of the season and blah, 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 whatever the case after the collapse last year, you know, it's easy to build a narrative around, you know, Machado easier than against Mookie because, you know, Mookie's Mookie. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're going to come back in a minute. Speaking of Trey and Mookie, we have a listener question about some lineup construction, plus a couple other listener questions left over from last week's mailbag episode. So we're going to answer those when we come back. So thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning, and please keep it Locked On Dodgers. Hey, spring is in the air. It's a time of renewal and growth, personally and professionally. As your small business grows, LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in de delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every week, four, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, we are back. We want to thank you again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. Uh, when you're done with this for your next listen, maybe check out the Locked On Now podcast. There's recaps of MLB games with analysis from our local experts, taking fans through the season like no other network. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Vince, we had a question. We had a, a few questions that uh, you didn't get to in, in last week's mailbag question or, or mailbag episode. And one of them, uh, was from Dale Skidmore at Skidmore 2024. And uh, he asks, is there any way Dave Roberts will put Trey Turner in the leadoff spot and move Mookie to the three spot? Actually, he just said Turner. I think it's safe to assume he didn't mean Justin Turner batting leadoff. Uh, so we'll, we'll assume that. But, you know, Trey Turner and Mookie Betts are both kind of prototypical leadoff men and also guys who you could bat anywhere because they both have power. They're both very good hitters in addition to being fast. Uh and so, you know, th this question came five-ish days ago, and Mookie has done nothing but rake since then. Uh, probably hit, what, three or four more home runs since this came out. And I think that's kind of the motivation for this question is, should Mookie be batting somewhere in the order where he's going to get guys on base in front, of, uh, in front of him more often? What do you think? I mean, I'm not touching uh... – What's been successful so far? Mookie Betts has been in the three hole before, been you know out of the leadoff spot for the Dodgers. Didn't quite hit, you know. I don't think it's a matter. I think it was more, uh, you know, not necessarily the correlation. I think it just happened. And that's how it was at that time. Mookie was in the slump, uh, but I don't think you know. Mookie Betts has the most runs scored in the league. Mookie Betts has scored, like I said, a run in in the game for twelve straight games. He's hitting very well. Uh, he now, I think, is one behind Soriano for most multi-homer games out of the leadoff spot. So he's a guy that has done damage from the leadoff spot for his entire career. I don't see a reason to move him. You know, Trey Turner is a guy that we talked about. You know, if he's not hitting, he's not getting on base. And Mookie Betts isn't like that. Mookie Betts isn't hitting. He's still finding ways to get on base. He's still drawing walks. If Trey Turner's not hitting, he's not really getting on base. He's not a guy to draw walks. Yeah, he's faster than Mookie Betts, but, you know, realistically, that doesn't translate too much because they're not stealing bases at every chance they get anyways. Uh, so I see no reason to move them. I guess if you really wanted to move somebody, you could flip Freddie and Turner, but I don't see a reason to do that either, especially Roberts likes the righty-lefty-righty, uh, you know, mix. So, yeah, I don't see a reason for it. Yeah, I I'm with you. You know, I talked yesterday about the Peter Principle about how if you're good at your job, you get promoted and you only stop getting promoted once you're not good at your job anymore. And so then you're just stuck in a job you're not good at. Uh, I don't see the point of, you know, for me, Mookie having so much success out of the leadoff spot is a reason to leave him in the leadoff spot, not a reason to think about moving him somewhere else. Uh, and and yeah, you you could dream about, oh, what if four of those 12 home runs had come with, with two runners on instead of solo homers or whatever. But you know what? 
for one thing, the Dodgers lineup is deep. Gavin Lux is often in front of on him on base in front of Mookie. You know, yeah, not the first time up. It, batting leadoff guarantees you're going to have at least one at bat a game with nobody on base. But other than that, it's not that much of a difference. And you know what Mookie's getting on, and he's scoring a ton of runs, and it's hard to hard to complain about that, and definitely not worth a change in my mind. Yeah, for sure. Um, we'll stay with go from lineup construction to roster construction a bit. From Jerry, question from Jerry at Jerry underscore J underscore Via it says, Will we see Jake Lamb or Kevin Pilar at any point this season? I think we will. And, you know, I, I think really it's going to come down to injuries because uh, the, the challenge with both of those guys, and I, I don't want to belabor these roster rules, but I, I, in case you don't totally understand, right now, Pilar and Lamb are both not on the 40 man roster. And so they would have to be added to the 40 man roster. And then the other side is they're also both veterans, so they can't be optioned. Uh, they can't just be, once they're on a 40 man roster, they can't be sent back to the minor leagues without DFAing them. And so both of them are hitting well in the minor leagues. And so I don't think at this point, actually, I don't know if Lamb is, I haven't looked at, but I think he, I know Pilar is raking in AAA. Um, but both of them, you would run the risk of losing them when you had to DFA them to get them off the roster. And so I think, you know, if somebody was to get injured, yeah, I think those guys are viable options. But I don't think, you know, when people were talking about Max Muncy, maybe, you know, put him or you know, sending him to the minors, even if he would agree to a minor league assignment or whatever, uh, or if it was, you know, whoever, uh, Edwin Rios, if, if they wanted to send him down a little bit to get him more regular at bats. I don't think it's worth calling up one of those guys just for a week or two uh, because then you have to DFA them to get them off the roster. And that's uh, that's the challenge. That's why they're both still in AAA. Um, and, and the fact that the Dodgers have been much healthier than we would have, at least on the offensive side. Pitching side, they've had their share of injuries like always. But on the offensive side, it's been the same. I mean, the, Zach McKinstry was up and down, but even that, it was, he wasn't replacing anybody. I think every, every position player who's currently on the Dodgers roster has been on the roster the entire season. They haven't had injuries yet. They will. There will be injuries, and whether they're big ones or small ones, they're going to come. And that's, I think, when we'll start to see talk of Lamb and Pilar. You know, if an outfielder gets hurt and is going to be out for a month, well, yeah, let's get Kevin Pilar up there. You know, if uh, Justin Turner goes down, you know, he's – however old he is, uh, not as old as me, but older than Vince. So somewhere in that ballpark, if he goes down with a, a nagging injury and he's going to be out for a month, then you think, okay, maybe Jake Lamb makes sense right now. Uh, but just to, just to get them up for a week or two to give somebody else a break or whatever, I, I just don't think it's likely just because of the roster setup. Yeah. And, you know, numbers notwithstanding, I, I, I think it would be Pilar before Lamb just for the sake of, the Dodgers technically have a need for outfielder more than they do for another guy that can play first and third. Even if an infielder gets hurt, you know, even if like Justin Turner got hurt, I think they would still bring up Pilar because they could use Taylor and Muncie at third and keep Lux at second. And then, you know, they'd have somebody to play left if they needed to, um, or even out, you know, hands are up or token play third base. So I think it's Pilar a little bit more likely, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, and I, I did just look, and I know that Jake Lamb started slow in AAA this year, but uh, yeah, he's got a 906 OPS and 10 homers, so uh, he is hitting pretty well. So, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see one or both of those guys as potential trade bait at the trade deadline too, because they might be guys who, and both of them do have opt outs available. Uh, I think they were this month. I think if they don't opt out, I, I don't know when when those dates are, but they might have might have both already committed to staying in the organization. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. I, I think we'll see them at some point, but who knows when or why, yeah. uh, our last question that we wanted to cover that you didn't get to cover last week is from at T H U R J underscore on Twitter. And he asks, how do I, as a newcomer to baseball, get to understand the nuances of the game, especially the statistical part? I love this question. I, I wish I had better answers, but I think you and I both probably have experience uh you know things that we've done to uh i mean everybody starts somewhere and you know for me I, i've been watching baseball since i was old enough to watch anything basically i mean my brother and i used to come home from school and we'd turn on tbs and watch the braves game that started at 
4:35 uh, p.m. Pacific time, and so you know you you watch that game and mute it because the Braves announcers were terrible. And then you know sometimes you get a Dodger game on TV, but you know game of the week, everything. We've been watching baseball, and you know for me a lot of it was actually baseball cards. I don't know if you collected baseball cards, I don't know if we've talked about that much, but I uh, I collected baseball cards as a kid. Uh, I, I sometimes joke, you know, when I one of the reasons I could do math really well is because. Like I can do any division problem to three syllables or th three syllables until I have an English degree to three decimal points, because that's how batting average is calculated. And uh, I told my daughter once that's th one of the advantages of instead of having friends, having baseball cards, um, you know, so a lot of it was baseball cards for me, but just watching baseball, you pick up on things and there's so much information out there right now, whatever you want to learn about, there's, there's stuff there. If you're a reasonably smart person, just go to fan graphs and just read through some of their glossaries. If, if that's kind of thing, you know, you can, you can learn so much and not just, not even about the specifics of what does this stat mean, but just kind of the, you get a broader concept of the things that some people are thinking about, about baseball. Yeah. I mean, in terms of nuances of the game, not getting like deep statistically, it's, you know, watch baseball or watch more baseball. Um, you know, try to watch it if you can with someone that knows baseball. I mean, the amount of people that have just – even if you go to, like, one Dodger game with me, you know, if you want to learn about it and you ask me questions or whatever the case, you're going to learn. There's always something new that happens at baseball games. Um, you know, I'm thinking I'm beyond the point to where I get stumped. I don't get stumped very often anymore, but uh, there has been times where, you know, start a group chat with my uncle and my dad and my brother and something happens and we try to figure out what it is. Uh, if that's not available to you, it's just a matter of, like, watching baseball – you know, paying attention. If you want to get deep into it, you know, taking notes about what you didn't understand, you know, you can ask us, you can ask somebody in, in your life if they like baseball. And then in terms of stats, I think this is where, you know, just it's just a matter of what information you want to know. Like, especially now, I, I've tried to incorporate more stats this season into like the conversations that we've had. And, you know, it's just a matter of what are you looking for or what's, you know, what do you want to know? Like, you know, WRC plus, someone throws you a WRC plus and they say it's 112, you have no idea what that means. But if you learn about it, you can quickly, at least at the very least, know that 100 is average and 112 is 12% better than average. But at the very least, you know somebody with 112 WRC plus is 12% better than the average player. Now, if you want to get deeper into it, then you look deeper into it and see what it is. But I think it's a matter of, you know, finding out what's good, what's decent, what's average numbers wise, and then filling in the information around that. Uh, that's how I found it easiest for me, especially with some of these advanced stats. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's going to be like, watch more baseball, ask more questions if you have the ability to do so. Yeah. And watching baseball in person, if you can, is, is great because on TV, you, you are bound by what the camera's showing you. And every once in a while, if one of the announcers picks on something, picks up on something really interesting, they'll show a replay and show what the right fielder was doing on that play or whatever. But when you're there in person, you can make those decisions for yourself. And, you know, when I go to games with my kids, uh, all, especially my boys who play baseball, you know, my, my daughter isn't as interested in the nuance and, and I respect that. Uh, but my sons who both play baseball, you know, I, I say, Hey Ryan, you're a shortstop. Watch what Trey Turner's doing as the pitcher is going to in, into his delivery. You know, what's he doing? How's he getting ready? Uh, you know, I love watching Cody Bellinger out in center field because like it doesn't seem right how he gets those jumps. And, and so I want to know how he does that. Uh, a couple of thoughts I would have. There's a lot of good books out there. First book that I ever read that got me into it was actually Moneyball. I never saw the movie until three weeks ago. I saw Moneyball for the first time. I've read the book eight times, you know, and there's a ton of stuff there. There's a lot of good books, uh, you know, uh, Smart Baseball by friend of the show, Keith Law. Uh, Brian Kenny had a book a couple of years ago. I can't remember what it was called. Uh, Rob Nyer has a couple really good books that help on more of the st statistical side. He's been on the show too. Uh, I should get Brian Kenny on the show if I'm going to talk about his book. Anyway, a lot of good books out there. Uh, so yeah, there's a ton of ways to learn. And, uh, and like Vince said, you can hit us up. I actually got a message from somebody just today uh, asking a question, something he didn't understand about roster rules. He, he asked how come if Seager and Bellinger won rookie of the year in back-to-back -back years, how come they're not hitting for agency in back-to-back -back years? And so I was able to explain to him, you know, because Seager came up at the end of 2015. Uh, Bellinger didn't come up until three weeks into the 2017 season. And so Bellinger is just shy of six years of service time at the end of this year. You know, anyway, so a lot of stuff. Feel free to shoot us questions because we, 
you know, we know a little bit and we love uh, talking baseball. So uh, anything else on that question, Vince? Yeah, the other part is if you're at a game and somebody's talking like they know, don't assume that they know. Especially if he's on a date and trying to impress a girl. Yeah. Because so he doesn't know what he's talking about. I, I try very carefully with people that, you know, it's hard to, you know, you you, don't, you know, you can't, I guess you can't assume that you would want to trust us, but you know, I would do a little bit of research. He's practice. always sitting two rows behind you. So <laughs> yeah. ju just look for that. Yeah. Uh, the, loud, right. the loudest guy is not the smartest guy. No. Uh, in fact, it's always the opposite. Yeah. Uh, we're going to come back in just a second. We're going to revisit the Dodgers Nationals trade from last year and, you know, see if we would do it again. So thanks again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every day. And please keep it Locked On Dodgers. All right, we are back. Uh, Vince, the Dodgers are playing the Nationals. It was kind of interesting. Josiah Gray pitched for the Nats on Tuesday. Cabert Ruiz was catching. That's the two centerpieces in that the Dodgers sent to. I think they sent a total of four players, but those were the two uh, keynote players in the trade for Max Scherzer and Trey Turner last year. Uh, Trey Turner hit a two-run homer off of Josiah Gray with Cabert Ruiz catching. Um, and, you know, there's obviously been some some pluses and minuses to that trade. Max Scherzer last year had some huge moments in a Dodger uniform, got his 3,000th career strikeout through an immaculate inning, had a great moment, closed out the National League Division Series against the Giants. Uh, he also uh, didn't, you know, could, couldn't answer the call in the NLCS and when the Dodgers needed him, which is not necessarily a criticism of him, just an accurate description of what happened. Uh, and then he left in free agency and and signed for a ton of money with the Mets. So the Dodgers got basically three months of Scherzer, and they will get at least a, a year and a couple months of Trey Turner. Uh, we don't know yet if they will extend him beyond this season. Uh, but, you know, do you have any regrets about that trade, Vince? No. I mean, I would still do that trade probably 10 out of 10 times just based on the fact of, Without Scherzer, you know, the Dodgers might still get to the point where they get to the NLDS and play the Giants again. And even though Scherzer wasn't, you know, light, he was he was lights on one of those games with the uh, Dodgers and score any runs. But I think, you know, without the World Series, beating the Giant, you know, beating the Giant, ending the Giants season in the NLDS was you know, right there behind a World Series just based on, you know, I would rather have – if you're not going to win a World Series, eliminating the Giants is like the next best thing about like, being in the postseason, I would say. Um, so I would keep it for that aspect. And, you know, even with Josiah, you know, he's bad, not a great start, and he's been, you know, a decent pitcher this year, nothing nothing great, nothing amazing, maybe looking like a 3-4 guy rather than a 1-2 guy. You know, Kiba Ruiz, realistically – didn't have a, didn't have a spot on this team and wouldn't have a spot on this team for a while. Will Smith, one of the best catchers in baseball, and you know as a backup, Austin Barnes this year has been proving to be pretty decent. So I don't have any issues with it, but that's you know because of what the Dodgers have. They have Diego Cartaya, you know, next man up in terms of catcher, top prospect. They have Ryan Pepio. They have uh, you know Andre Miller or uh, they have Andre Jackson, but they have Ryan Pepio and they have Bobby Miller right behind them. So they have pitchers coming up. Now, yeah, people can can turn and say, "Oh, yeah, but you know, Josiah is healthy. The Dodgers need a healthy starter right now." But realistically, they probably don't go get maybe Heaney and Anderson if you know Josiah is there, or they don't do other things that happen. So, yeah, I don't have any regrets about it really, and it's kind of wild because when you think about it, like if you traded, you know, if you ask anybody else, you trade your top pitching prospect at the time, your top position player prospect at the time, you know, the way Scherzer, the way the whole Scherzer thing went down. You know, the way Trey Turner might not be back after this season, you know, might be a different answer for everybody, but I don't have any issues with it. Yeah, for me, you you can't really go based on the results. You know, if the Dodgers had won the World Series last year, I don't think it would have made the trade any better or worse because what they did was they they went out and got the two best players that were traded at the trade deadline, the two best guys available, uh, and, and that is something they've consistently done under this ownership group is they go out and get what they need to, to be competitive. And yeah, it didn't win them a world series last year, but you know, if for no other reason than that, it tells us, Oh, this, this ownership group is committed to winning. That's great. And Andrew Friedman's really smart. You know, like you said, Cabert Ruiz didn't have a spot on this team. Yeah. He's hitting fine for the nationals, but I don't think he's a guy with between Will Smith and Diego Cartaya, 
we're never going to say, man, I wish they still had Cabert Ruiz. Uh, and, and Josiah Gray, yeah, I, I I hope the best for him. Like, like you know, except when he's facing the Dodgers, unlike you, who you went into this game, root for Josiah, whatever, man. I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that God likes me more than he likes you, I guess. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, it, it's a trade you make. And prospects, you, prospects exist in, uh, sometimes to come up and become Corey Seager and Cody Bellinger and Walker Bueller and Clayton Kershaw and contribute to the major league team. But sometimes they exist to be Cabert Ruiz and Josiah Gray and uh, Zach Pop and, you know, I can't remember any of the other guys who they traded for Manny Machado um, or Willie Calhoun, who they got traded for you, Darvish. You know, that's why you have this prospect depth because a lot of those guys are going to get traded because there's just not room for all of them on the big league roster. So I think it was a good trade. And, you know, hopefully for everybody, it ends up being a win-win trade. Hopefully the, the Nats end up being happy about the trade too because the Dodgers, the, the Nats were trying to shed payroll. The Dodgers don't do that, you know? And so if the Nats were able to shed that payroll, get a couple of young guys, great, good for them. And the Dodgers just keep that window open of, of competition. And I love that you accidentally said Andre Miller instead of Andre Jackson, because they both went to the university of Utah, uh, who are the big rivals of my alma mater, BYU. So uh, Andre Miller was more of a basketball player though. I doubt he was much of a baseball player. Yeah, probably not. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, no matter which way you look at it, I don't think there's going to be anybody thinking, you know, even if Josiah turns into a Cy Young down the line at some point in his career, you know, I don't think it's a matter of, oh, man, I wish we had Josiah Gray or Kiebert, uh, other than the fact that, you know, we kind of like those guys just because Kiebert looked like a nice guy and Josiah was a nice guy. Yep, yeah. Uh, anybody that comes on the podcast, I like, you know. I still root for Charlie Culberson. He came on – I'm rooting for Matt Beatty, uh, except when it affects the Dodgers. So, yeah, you know what? Good, good for them. Uh, I, I really do wish the best for them. And now the Dodgers might not face Josiah Gray again this year. Uh, if they do, I'll root against them that game, but I'll root for him every other game. All right, uh, that's going to do it for today. You got anything else, Vince? No, it's a weird uh, 1 p.m. Wednesday game that's on the East Coast, so uh, looking forward to that, I guess. Yeah, that is weird. It's so starting at 4 o'clock local time. Yeah. Oh, weird. Uh, all right, kind of a getaway-ish day. So, all right, thank you all for making Locked on Dodge your first listen every day. We really appreciate it. We love that you are listening and watching. If you aren't watching or listening every day, Please add one or two days a month to your rotation. If you have friends or family who love the Dodgers as much as you do, you can tell them about the show. Maybe they'll like it. Uh, we we really appreciate all of that that you do to help us succeed as a podcast because we love doing it. Uh, even though it's a lot of work, it's a lot of fun too. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram and on Twitter at Locked On Dodgers. You can all of, you can follow Vince on Twitter at Vince Samperio. You can follow me at Snydog. And as we mentioned earlier, the DMs are open in all of those places if you have any questions or comments. You can also reach out to us via email at LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com, or you can send us a voicemail or a text message at 323-863-LOCK-5625. We are here every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be here with us. When you get in your car or sit on your couch, tell your smart device to play podcast Locked On Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one.